What can I say to these people? The community center is filled with cigarette smoke. Everyone here sits in a circle of chairs to complain about their bosses. How they get called to come into work even when they're approved for time off. How they get screwed out of holiday bonuses or maternity care and more. I don't say anything when I come here. I sit quietly and listen and think about how I got where I am. When it's my turn to talk, I pass. It's not like I'm going to say these people have it easier than I do. My story started in my sophomore year of college. During that time, I didn't have many options in way of employment. The few people who were willing to work around my classes already had enough workers and weren't hiring. Thankfully, there were plenty of odd jobs listed on the cork board scattered around campus. Most of them didn't pay much and only required a few hours of your time. But the pay was better than nothing, and I'd rather eat ramen every day for a month than nothing at all. Unfortunately, lots of people were in the same boat, so all these jobs were first come, first serve. Eventually, I found one asking for a handyman. I don't know my way around tools, but I was young and dumb enough to justify that, with the aid of a good YouTube tutorial, I could easily learn how to install sinks or change the oil in a car. When I arrived for my first day, my initial impression of Professor Borgensen was that he didn't look like any professor I'd ever seen. He was tall, but very thin. His hair was dark, but there was some gray at the temples, making him look older than he was. If I had to guess, he was in his early 30s. He explained that the job was easy, and the first thing I would have to do would be to remind him to eat. I found that a little funny, and smiled. But he was serious. He then explained that he often gets lost in his work and forgets little things like that. When he told me the pay, I accepted the job right away. I'd begin every day by brewing his coffee in a pot, which he would serve himself. Thankfully, my classes were close, so this never interfered with my day. I'd do this again between 2 and 4 in the afternoon each day as well. The second time I went to his office, I would call restaurants and either have them deliver to him or pick up something for him to eat. In less than a week, he told me to keep the coffee coming, but he didn't need me to order food every day. After a few months, he started to tell me to do things that made me nervous. First, it was things like grabbing a file from some other office, but would escalate to picking up packages in weird and occasionally terrifying places. Before long, he had me taking chemicals out of the lab without proper paperwork. Each time I approached him about this, he would say that everything was above board and not to worry about it. When the chem lab treated the chemicals I took as though they were stolen, I went to Borgensen and told him about it, begging him to clear this up. That was when I learned that Borgensen was using this information to blackmail me. As horrible as he was, he wasn't completely unsympathetic to my situation and agreed to give me my college credits if I kept doing the jobs he asked me to do. I didn't have much of a choice. At this point, he had enough information to get me expelled from school, so I continued to work for him. Besides, who would the police be more likely to believe? Me, or a man who was up for an award in excellence in laboratory science for neurological research. After that, I stole copper wire for him. He required so much that I was working on it for the better part of a month. Sometimes the buildings I stole from were being developed. Other times it was someone's house who happened to be gone for the holidays. I tried to ask him what kind of experiments he was working on, but... Everything I asked, he would fly into a fit of rage and frustration, complaining about how hard the work he was doing really was, and that he didn't have time to go into details because it would surely go over my head. In my junior year, he started using me as an alibi, either to get out of some kind of trouble or as an excuse so he could leave and return, return to his secretive experiments. Every time he'd have me meet somebody, he'd coach me on what to say to them, and when to say it. I'm abruptly taken out of my thoughts when the next person in the support group starts talking. I'm only half paying attention. I'm thinking about Borgensen 
and staring at the same three triangles on the floor. I hear her say something about compensation for driving. A slight smile crept over my face when I heard this, because I wished I had that woman's problems. At least Borgensen gave me a truck and refunded me on the gas I used when I drove around, picking up the freshest roadkill I could find. During my senior year, I learned about Professor Borgensen's connections with some people in the school's zoology department. I discovered this when I actually had the official paperwork to pick up the body of howler monkeys and the body of a bonobo ape. I had been in his house a few times, but the first time I was allowed inside was right before the hurricane was about to make landfall. I thought I was called to help him prepare his house for the rain, but instead it was to do something I was not prepared for. It smelled to the same chemicals that I had stolen for him, and a coppery smell that was not unlike the scent of blood. In his upstairs bedroom was a makeshift lab, and in it was the body of a huge and hideous creature, strapped to a table and submerged in ice. It was hard to see the body, but to me it was as though he'd stitched many of them together. Borgensen was in a rush and was in no mood to answer questions. He needed to do this experiment before the storm hit, and since he still had all the blackmail material over my head, I did too. After hours of telling me to flip a switch here or press a button there, the hurricane was right on top of us. I wanted to stop, but Borgensen insisted that we keep at it, and that it was now or never. I was terrified as the gale force wind broke the windows. Borgen said I had to yell over it for me to hear his instructions, but eventually he gave this creature a pulse. Since we were on the second floor and the hurricane was tearing the house apart all around us, we had to bring this unconscious body down to the main floor where Borgensen had converted a small room into a cage. Borgensen and I were barely able to get to the basement by the time the hurricane tore the house apart. As the water rose and the violent sound of wind filled my ears, I prayed that I would get out of this. Borgensen, on the other hand, was only concerned about the thing he had created. When it was all over and the hurricane had passed, we discovered the body of the creature had been crushed and died. There is supportive clapping when the last speaker is done telling their story. I clap along, and when it's the next person's turn to speak, I keep my chin on my chest and return to my thoughts. The next person complains about unpaid wages, but I can't relate to that. Borgensen was many things, but he was not a wage thief and paid me for everything I'd done. Disgruntled by the loss of his creature, Borgensen left me alone, and I was able to focus on my studies. The rare times I saw him were when I prepared his coffee. It was during one of these times that he told me that since I was a senior and wouldn't be around forever, he was searching for a new assistant. After telling me this, he solemnly shook his head and gave me my last payment with a generous bonus especially for someone with my financial situation. I couldn't have been happier, not because of the money, but because I was finally free of the man who I learned to hate with every fiber of my being. I would soon graduate and move back to my hometown, where I would spend ten years repressing the memories of Professor Borgensen. A man in the group who goes by Barry is the next to speak. He complains about his boss calling him into work on pre-approved days off. I feel for him. In a weird way, I can relate. Thought I was done with Borgensen, but then one night a stranger comes to Moe's Bar, my place of employment. He seems friendly, and even though he didn't look familiar, I saw something in his eyes that reminded me of what I'd seen in the mirror after a night doing Borgensen's bidding. Once the barflies started making their way out, the stranger confessed that he was the newest assistant to Borgensen, and the only reason he was at the bar was because Borgensen was in town and needed my help. I refused, but when the stranger told me that Borgensen still had the blackmail material, and if I didn't come along, he was going to use it against me. 
when Barry wraps up his story, everyone claps, and it snaps me out of my memories and returns me to the present. It's my turn to speak. I've been coming to the support group for a long time, but I've never said more than two words. After all, what can I say? That if I could, I'd trade my position with any of these people. That they should get on their knees and thank their lucky stars for not having bosses that blackmail them. That Borgensen still forces me to do things for him, like stealing bodies from the morgue. There's only one answer I can come up with. Pass. Good evening, everyone. It's me, Dr. Plague. Thank you so much for joining me for tonight's story. If you think you might be able to handle just one more creepy tale, go ahead and click on one of the stories you can doubtlessly see appearing at the end of this one. If you're not subscribed, go ahead and hit that subscribe button, too. Maybe hit that bell so you don't miss any of the spooky things that we do here. If, like so many of my patrons, you decide you'd like to get your spooky a little bit earlier, why not come on down to Patreon and have a look at some of the great tiers that I have. My $5 tiers get their spooky a little early, and they have their name read out at the end of every TikTok and every YouTube video that I make. If you'd like a copy of my latest book, there's a link below to my Amazon profile. I've got many books, I'm sure you'll find one that'll suit you there. I always recommend Stragview Stories, as it's the one I'm the most proud of. It contains a large collection of prison horror stories out of Stragview, the prison that I've made in the Georgia Hills. So, if you'd like to have a look, come on down. Before we go, let's go ahead and thank our patrons. Thanks to Janet for being our Spooky Skeleton Tier contributor. And thanks to Winter, Zeronin, Emily Coltsfoot, Stephanie Carrington, Marianne Schuler, Tyler Parker, and Jennifer Damron for being my Ghostly Reader Tier contributors. Thanks, everyone. We just couldn't do the show without you. And as always, thanks for stopping by. Dr. Plague, signing off. Have a wonderful evening.